So we're going to jump into this morning. So a lot of churches, how, how many of you have heard of this thing called the Apostles' Creed? Um, yeah, some of you guys maybe have heard of that. This morning, we're going to do something a little different. Some churches start out with the Apostles' Creed. We are going to start out this morning with the Toddler's Creed. You guys ready for this? All right. This is the Toddler's Creed. If I like it, it's mine. All right. If it's in my hand, it is mine. If I can take it from you, it is also mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours. That's key. That's so key. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. So you got your Legos, your Mega Blocks, all of it. If I'm doing, or no, I just said that one. If it looks just like mine, it is also mine. Man, that's crazy. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you are playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. Mm. If it is broken, it's yours. You can have it all day long, right? If it's broken, though, and you start to have fun with it, it's mine again. And then if there is any doubt in your mind, it is mine. So that is the toddler's creed. Now, as we get ready to jump into this morning's message, I just want to recap the series that we've been in. The series we've been in has been talking about the seven deadly sins. And we said they're deadly not because they are lethal, because all sin is lethal, right? But because all sin comes out of those seven. Now, We've looked at anger, we've looked at laziness, we've looked at pride, we've looked at lust, we've looked at gluttony, and today, if you didn't connect it with the toddler's creed, we're going to talk about greed, greed and selfishness. Now, real quick, could you throw up a picture of my boys? These are my boys. Now, you've got to say, oh, they're so cute. All right, because I'm going to tell my, my wife to look at this online and say, oh, they all think the boys are cute. They're gonna lo- she's going to love it. Now, these are my boys. Isaiah is five. He is the bigger one, obviously. And then the other one is Ezekiel. He is seven months old. And I absolutely love my boys. Wouldn't, don't know where I'd be without them. Love them. They beat me up all the time. Even the baby, I'll lay on the ground, and he comes over and goes, caw, caw, and just smacks me in the face. Oh, gosh, it's crazy. But something I've noticed as being a dad is my older son, he's a great, great big brother, but the, he has these tendencies to just be greedy and selfish sometimes. And usually he's really good, but every now and then it comes out. For example, the other day I was watching the boys by myself. It was was really hard. And uh, I'm I'm watching them at the house, and Ezekiel, the seven-month, he's not crawling yet, but he's doing like this body slide. So like he claps his hands and then just drags his body, and he's quick. You look at him for one second, and then you turn away, he's gone. He's in the kitchen. And I'll be like, where's the kid? Um, Calling my wife, oh, I lost the kid. Um, So he's crawling, and he sees something. He sees a toy that Isaiah has on the floor. And it's a big plastic, like, action figure kind of thing. And this thing, this toy, man, you can't break this toy. You could throw it against the wall. You could run over it with a car. You could hit somebody with it, and it ain't breaking. And my son sees it, my older son Isaiah, and he runs over and he runs and he runs and he runs and he runs. He goes, Zeke, Zeke, no, that's my toy. And then takes it from the baby. And Ezekiel looks at him up with like these cute little eyes and then goes, ah, and just starts wailing. I'm like, no, give him the toy. Oh gosh, it was terrible. Um, And then I, I get the toy from Isaiah, I give it to him. I was like, Isaiah, look, buddy. That toy, he's not going to break it. He's not going to drool. Like, even if he drools on it, we can clean it off. But, buddy, he's not going to break it. Let him share with him. And Isaiah looks at me, and he goes, okay, Daddy. And I'm like, good job, buddy. And then Isaiah, after that, actually, this is where this picture with the book comes from. Right after that, he goes, you know what? I'm going to read him a book. So he gets his little DC book and goes over to Ezekiel and starts reading to him. And Ezekiel's not crying anymore. He's sitting there, and he's actually looking and He's loving it. And I go, wow, that's awesome. But Isaiah, usually a really good big brother, had that moment of greed. That's mine. That's me. That's, he didn't want to share. 
The thing is, the, the point of me bringing that up is I think a lot of us, and actually I know a lot of us, have this tendency to be greedy, this tendency to be selfish. And we see things and we take it and it's ours and we don't want to share it. It's ours, right? But notice something in the scriptures. Jesus actually talks about greed. Jesus talks about selfishness. Jesus talks about even money. And notice something what he says here in Matthew 6, 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Mm. Look at that. Notice that. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus says we can't serve two masters because we will hate one and love the other. We will be devoted to one and despise the other. He is noting how extreme your feelings are going to be towards the master. Then he says you cannot serve God and money. Those are the two masters we're going to talk about today. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money. Now, most of us at work, you might have a couple different bosses. You might have a manager, you might have an owner, you might have an accountant or a supervisor, and there's a couple different levels of bosses, right? But what happens when one boss says to do this, which is contrary to what your other boss says? What do you do, (laughs) right? Well, you can't do this and then also do what the other boss said. So you have to come to a conclusion. You have to go, well, who is my real boss? Who do I listen to? Who has the power to fire me, right? That's the one I'm going to listen to. Because you can only listen to one. Now look at that verse again. It says you cannot serve God and money. So what does that mean? Well, when Jesus is saying money, he's actually not just talking about money. What he's talking about is he's talking about material resources. So yes, he's talking about money, but he's talking about so much more than money. He's talking about the cars you have, the wealth you have in your bank. He's talking about the 401k you have. He's talking about everything you own, your material resources. You can either serve this selfish desire to build your material resources, or you can serve God his kingdom. But you can't do both. And you might be thinking, ah, but Pastor Dan, I think I can do both. Mm, Maybe, but not really. Because in reality, you're going to love one more than you love the other. There's going to be one that has more priority than the other. Look at the scriptures says eventually you will love one and hate the other. There's going to be one that you serve. One that's going to be everything to you. And what Jesus is really trying to say is you can serve God or you can serve your own greedy desires. And greed is a desire to build your kingdom, to build your material resources. So what does a greedy person look like? Well, a greedy person looks like this. Someone who's constantly complaining about what they get. Or someone who is okay with hurting others to get what they want. Someone who is constantly working to get and get and get and get. It's all about what they get. It's all about what they want. That's what a greedy person looks like. And I want you to hear this clearly. That doesn't mean that you can't save save your resources, you can't save money. That doesn't mean you can't work really hard. No, those are actually biblical principles. I would say you could argue with the Bible that it is good to save your money. It is good to work hard, right? But the danger is with greed, it can actually lead to you being separated from the Father, separated from God. Our greed takes an all from God and puts it on ourselves. (coughs) 
Sorry about that. I'm losing my voice from Mega Sports Camp. But it goes back to the question we had at the first week of this series. How does this decision impact my relationship with God? If God asks you to do one thing, but your financial advisor or your wallet tell you to do another, who are you going to listen to? What would you do? Who's your master? Is your material resources and your own selfish desires more important than what God wants? Who's your master? So as we go through this morning's message, I want you to think, who is my master? And if we look at Matthew 6, if you're here this morning and you have your Bible or the version, we're going to be in Matthew 6 all morning, so you can go to Matthew 6. If we look at Matthew 6 and we look at the context, it actually is going to tell us three questions that we can ask ourselves to see who our true master is. The first question is this, how do you accumulate? And it says this in Matthew 6, 19 to 21 in the NET translation. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and devouring insects destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and devouring insects do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now remember verse 21 for later, but let's talk about verse 19. Most of us here, I don't think, have issues with moths. If you do, please come talk to me afterwards. I'd be very interested to see what that looks like. We don't have issues with moss, insects, or even thieves. Now, Matthew is saying this to show that earthly treasures are just temporary, that eventually they'll fade away, that they'll decay, they'll fall apart. But the things of heaven, they last forever. For eternity. So where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. Which begs the question, where is your treasure? What does that mean? How does that impact my finances? How does that impact my work? How does that impact my family? What does that mean, Dan? Well, first off, You might be thinking, can I save money? I'm just going to reemphasize this. You can work hard. You can save your money. But realize this. You can work really hard. You can earn a lot of money. You can save it all. But just know this. There's going to be a day where you lose it all. There's going to be a day where you die and all of that stuff means nothing. There's going to be a day where I die, and it's not going to mean a thing. I could literally die right now. Legit, I could fall right now and die. You all would cry. You'd be like, oh, my favorite pastor. I miss him so much. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do without him? And you'd be upset, but I can't take any of my wealth with me, none of it. And there's going to be a day where you die, and none of it is going to go with you. But the thing is, in the kingdom, in God's kingdom, it's eternal. It's forever. The treasure in his kingdom lasts forever. And when the economy tanks, when your 401k is going like this, and you're like, ah, treasure in his kingdom, it's constant. It never fails. It's never going down. The economy can't tank it. See, the treasures in the kingdom, it's anything that can go with you beyond the grave. So it's the times that you were obedient to him and his commands. That's building up treasure in his kingdom. The times souls were won for Christ. When people come to know Jesus and you were a part of it, that's treasure in the kingdom. Or taking care of the poor. When you're taking care of the poor, serving at your church, that is storing up things in the kingdom. Supporting the church, supporting missionaries, that is storing up things in the kingdom. So once again, where's your treasure? 
But here's the thing. Not only are you supposed to store up your treasure in the kingdom, you're also supposed to have a mindset that the king wants you to have, the master. If we look at Matthew 6, 2 to 4, Jesus is going to start to tell us the mindset that we should have. He says this, Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on streets so that people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But when you do your giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your gift may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Matthew 6, 5 to 6 says this. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners so that people can see them. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, it says this, When you fast, do not look sullen like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others when you are fasting, but only to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Notice something when those three verses, something very key. It's saying, do these biblical practices like giving, praying, uh, even fasting. What? In secret. It's not putting on a show for others going, hey, look what I'm doing. I'm giving. I'm investing in the kingdom. No. It's in secret. And that's the mindset Christ wants us to have. He wants us to invest in his kingdom. But not only that, he wants us to do it in secret. Because, thing is, if you look at the context, storing up treasure in the kingdom is basically verbatim looking for God's affirmation, not man's affirmation. But there are so many times we go, you know what, I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to give, and then someone give me a pat on the back. I did a good job. But that's not what it's about. It's about looking for his affirmation, not ours. Now, this is also about using our resources to meet other people's needs, their spiritual, their physical needs, and we do this in private. We should help others, and we don't need to go look for that affirmation. This is storing up treasures in the kingdom, and storing up treasures in the kingdom, it's not selfish. But living a greedy lifestyle, building up your own material resources, that is selfish. So the question is, where is your treasure? Do you tend to accumulate your treasure in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of yourself? The next question is this, is why are you worrying about your life? Someone who is greedy always is worrying about their life. Always. Me, 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 me. What about me? But look, look what Jesus says. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I'm going to say that again. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you eat or drink or about your body, what will you wear Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than any of these? Hmm. Look at that. I'm going to say that again. Yet I tell you, or no, I'm sorry. Aren't you more valuable than they are? Sometimes we get so worried. We're like, ah, I need this, I need this. But just realize what that says. Aren't you more valuable than they are? It says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you drink, what you eat, what you wear. 
See, when people are greedy, they focus on themselves. I'll eat at better restaurants. I'm going to get the nicest food. But then they come into church, and then they'll sit down next to another family who can barely pay for the bread on their table. But they're so concerned. Oh, I need to eat at this restaurant. Or they're so concerned about wearing the best clothes. They need the designer brands and all that stuff. But then they'll come into church and they'll sit next to a family that can barely pay for the clothes on their kids' backs. Hmm. That's, that's tough. But that's real. And then something that also greedy people do is they tend to flaunt it. They tend to say, oh, look at the nice things I have. Look at this, look at this. That's what greedy people do. Now, I'm going to repeat this again because I just want you guys to understand where I'm coming from. Christians should plan for the future. They should work hard. They should save, but they shouldn't be anxious about their life. They shouldn't be worried about it. Why? It says in the text that God takes care of the birds, so he's going to take care of you. You know why? Because you're so much more valuable. He loves you so, so much. So much. But it comes back to this, this, this greedy mindset or a selfish mindset where we don't trust God, but we would rather trust ourselves. We'd rather go, I can provide for myself. I'm going to worry about my life. Ah. We'll tend to always be worried about our life and then we won't worry about others, actually. And that's a problem. Because there are people out in this broken world that need our help. And as Christians, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus going out into the world and worrying about other people, not ourselves. Now, hear me now. It's okay to have moments where you're worrying about yourself. It's okay to, to have those moments but my push is, do you tend to worry about yourself more than you do others? If you tend to worry about yourself more than others, you're greedy. If God is truly our master, our tendency would not be to worry about ourselves, but it would be to worry about others. We would actually tend to worry about others. We would actually be comforted that God is actually in control and that our life is in his hands. That's, and we would feel peace. We would feel comfort because we know he's in control. So let's recap real quick. The first question is this, how do you accumulate? And with that being said, where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. The second question is this, why do you worry about your life? Because we should trust God and care for others. The next question is this, why do you desire more than you need? Something we need to understand when it comes to greed, I've said it multiple different times, what is greed? It is a what kind of mindset? I'm going to ask you guys, what kind is it? It's selfish, right? It's a mindset that's all about me, and it's all about storing up things for myself. And it even pushes you to make sure, you know what, I'm going to have everything I want for my future. I'm going to have all the things I want. But if we continue in this passage, we can see that Jesus says what Jesus says about tomorrow. Now, you're going to see some similarities in this passage to the last passage because Jesus is actually doubling down. He's actually saying, you know what, this is so important. I need to talk to you guys again about this. So in Matthew 6, 30 to 34, he says this. He says, and if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today and tomorrow is tossed into the fire to heat the oven, won't he clothe you even more? You people of little faith. I'm going to read that again because what Jesus right there is kind of doing, what I imagine Jesus doing right there is like, he's like kind of slapping us on the face going, listen here. And if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today and tomorrow is tossed in the fire to heat the oven, won't he clothe you even more, you people of little faith? 
So then don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And then it goes on to say this. Let me just throw the next one up there. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So then do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus is saying he takes care of creation, the wild grass. He's making another statement just like he did about the birds. He's saying, I take care of the flowers, the grass. So how much more would I take care of you? You are created in his image and you are so much more valuable than grass. Then he goes on to say that we don't have to worry about what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear. Jesus says the unconverted, the unbelievers worry about those things. Those who don't serve Christ Jesus worry about those things. But if you serve God, you know that he's got it in his hands. That he's your heavenly father and he knows what he knows that you, what you need. How can we be worried about the same things the world is worried about? How can we be worried about the same things the world is worried about? As Christians, we're supposed to know that our Heavenly Father, He's going to provide. He's going to take care of us. Notice something, though, in the Scriptures. It doesn't say want. It says need. And greedy people tend to focus on their wants and not their needs. They're worried about getting the stuff that they want, not the basic necessities that they need. Jesus says something that's so contrary to greed in this passage. Jesus actually says not to pursue your material resources and your money and all that stuff. What he says is he says, pursue what? His righteousness and his kingdom. That is so good. That is a kick in the pants. He's like, pursue my kingdom, not your own. Basically, like we said earlier, use your material possessions to help others. Then all these things will be given to you, all the things you need. So then don't worry about tomorrow because God will provide. So seek him out, talk to him, listen to him. And let God do what only God can do, provide for you. So the question is, who is your master? Our three questions to help us clarify that in our own lives is this. It's how do we accumulate? Do we accumulate in the world or do we accumulate in his kingdom? And why do we worry about our life? And why do you desire more than you need? So as we get ready to, to wrap up and conclude this morning, when we look at greed, it is all about building your treasure up for you. It is all about building your own empire, your own kingdom. It's about worrying about yourself before you worry about others. It's about building up your future it's about selfishness. It's a selfish mindset. And what it shows to people and what it shows to God is that God is not your true master. That's what it is. As a follower of Christ, you have to decide, will I serve myself or will I serve God? You have to determine that. I can't determine that for you. Pastor Brian can't determine that for you. Only you can determine that. You have to determine who will be your master. And it comes back to that verse I said, remember for later, verse 21. It says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. 
I'm going to read that one more time. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This verse is so important for two reasons. It shows who your master is. So where your treasure is, that is your master. But then it also, on the flip side, it shows you how to have a new master. Look at it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We just sung a song, you can have my heart, God. You can have it all, right? The king of my heart. It's a jam. I love it. I'll sit here and I'll sing it all day long. But here's the thing. We sing songs like that and we say, you can have my heart. You can have it all. But then when it comes to our treasure, we go, no, that's mine. That's mine. Well, then you can't have your heart, can you? Because that's what the scripture says. Think about that. You can't have it. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be. You can't serve two masters. It's, it's crazy to me because I will talk to people and they'll say, I serve Jesus, but yet they don't fully understand this concept. This is a, this is a big concept. If you're not doing this, you're not truly serving Jesus. And practically, what I would challenge you guys this week, if you're like, hey, maybe I need to figure out where my master is, two ways you can figure out is I would challenge you and push you when you go home this week, or maybe you can do it while we reflect, is I would challenge you to look at your calendar and your bank account. What are the two biggest things on this earth that we treasure most? It's our time. It's our money. And when you look at your calendar, I can show you what's important in your life. When you show me your bank account, I can show you what's important in your life. But on those two apps that you can quickly pull out on your phone, you can look. Who's your master? Yourself or God? So I would challenge you with that this this morning as we get ready to reflect. But just know this, and I want to get ready to close and reflect, is there's going to come a day, like I said earlier, where you pass away. You don't know when that's going to be. But there's going to be two possible responses that you will have from God, the one true master. You could stand before God and he could say, you know what? You've done a great job. You have invested in my kingdom. You have served well at the church. You have, you know what, shared the gospel. You have invested everything in my kingdom. You've put my kingdom first. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And he'll welcome you into eternity. On the flip side, though, you could stand before the creator of the universe, the the person who's supposed to be your master, and you could stand in front of him, and he's just looking at you dumbfounded like, Who are you? And he could look at you and go, oh, you didn't really put my kingdom first. You actually followed the toddler's creed. You were all about yourself, right? You didn't put others first. You didn't invest in my kingdom. Get away from me, you wicked, nasty servant. Apart from me, I never knew you. That's two complete opposite responses. One is very harsh, but it's going to be very true. So who are you? What master do you serve? Something that I want us to do this morning as we take communion is a lot of times we we think on what he did on the cross. His blood was spilled. His body was broken. And that's awesome. We should do that. But I want to add add something this morning as we think into this. Have you guys heard of the phrase, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, right? Well, a lot of times we focus on the Savior part, but we forget that he's supposed to be our Lord and our Master. So this morning, look at communion as a time to reflect and think that he is our Lord and our Master. This isn't just what I'll say the kids usually think about in kids' church is snack time. This isn't snack time. This is a time to remember not only what he did on the cross, but that he's supposed to be the master of our life, the ruler of our life, the Lord of our life, our king. And whatever he says, we're going to do it. 
And when he's telling us to build in his kingdom, invest in his kingdom, we're going to put that first. We're going to put that in front of our own kingdom. Now think about that as we take the cracker. Just take the cracker. Now as we get ready to take the juice, I want you to think, do I truly invest in his kingdom over my own? Would you take the juice with me? All right, I'm going to get ready to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to dismiss. But if I could have the altar workers come up front. If you're here this morning and you feel like God's kind of tugging on your heart and you need to have some business with God, I would challenge you to stay here don't leave. Come up and pray with an altar worker. Sit in your seat and pray. Now's the time to do some business with God. But I'm going to pray and then if everyone else is dismissed, but if you want to talk to God, this is going to be a nice, quiet place for you to do so. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for everything you have done for us. God, I pray, Lord, as we get ready to go through this week, that we wouldn't just be a Sunday morning Christian. God, that we would be someone who invests in your kingdom and not our own. God, that your kingdom would be first in our minds. God, I pray, Lord, that this would be a family that's all about investing in your kingdom. God, that we would start to see people in Berlin reach for you because we are a group of people that are all about serving in your kingdom and investing in your kingdom first before our own. In your name we pray. Amen.